Welcome to LOA Today. Walt Thiessen and Life Coach Cindy Chavez here. Today is Wednesday, February the 27th, 2019. It's 4 p.m. in New York, 1 p.m. in Los Angeles, 9 p.m. in London and Sydney, Australia. Good morning. It's 8 a.m. Wherever you are in the world, thank you for joining us for another episode of LOA Today, your daily dose of happy. And I'm so excited because it's Neville Day. I am, I love Neville Yay. Day. We don't get to do <laughs> Neville as much anymore. So every time we get to do it once a week, that's a happy day for me. That's a really happy day. Plus, I get to talk with my friend, Cindy Chavez. Cindy, how you doing? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. I, I'm actually doing very well considering I was watching those hearings on TV. And, and whenever you're watching news or, or politics or something like that, it has a tendency to bring you down. And I managed to get through it <laughs> feeling laughter and joy and so forth. So I, I figure I'm doing pretty well considering. So you know, not that I, I recommend so that too. others do that, but, you know, yeah. Yeah, you got to – it's seriously, it's my way of practicing staying in a high vibration state. It seems weird. I mean, it's not something I recommend to people. But I, I, I'm practicing getting my boundaries up in place and just not letting through the stuff that I don't want to let through. And I think I'm actually getting stronger doing it. So, I mean, you could probably do push-ups too, but <laughs> this is my way to get stronger. <laughs> well, so. I think, you know, that reminds me of a couple of times in my life, a handful of times, I've had an experience where someone has said or done something or some event has happened that normally... I would have had a certain reaction to, mm -hmm. and I didn't. Mm. And I almost like wanted to force myself to have the reaction. You know, it's like, like someone may say, wow, I bet you were really upset about that. Right. And I was like, not really. And it's like, what's wrong with me? Why? why is this <laughs> not? And it, what, it's not anything wrong. It's no. that those triggers aren't there anymore. Yeah. And right. And but it's, it's a weird thing to recognize sometimes when you go, wow, this seems like this should be something that bothers me, but it really isn't. <laughs> so it's a, it, it's a good thing. I think that starts happening with practice. And it's yeah. not about ignoring, you know, no, uh, no. real life stuff or pushing it away or anything like that. Because in those moments, I've been completely present to what's going on and able to formulate, okay, what's the best response to this? Right. But there hasn't been any real emotional charge, you know, mm. and it, it, whether it's a personal event or like a world event, like you're talking about, like, right. I don't want to throw a brick at the TV, you know, it's just like, huh, that's yeah. interesting. <laughs> Louise and I both came away from watching the hearing with the same idea. All this good stuff is going to come out, not necessarily the, the, what the hearing itself is investigating, but just the fact that, uh, you know, who, who the characters are involved in and what they do and how they live their lives, you know, ways that most of us find to be rather reprehensible, all that is, is creating this stirring of the pot that's bringing to the surface stuff that's been hidden for the longest period of time. It's now being right. exposed to the open air, and that's got to, in the long run, produce positive results. So, I mean, right. it's, you, you have to put a spin on stuff. You have to, to find that silver lining. But that's what we were doing. We were finding the silver lining. And I, and I genuinely believe, I genuinely believe that this is going to lead to some really positive stuff for society overall in the years to come. So... This is a good I think time. so too. You know, evolution is slow, mm -hmm. and we can watch sometimes things unfold, and there are painful aspects to yep. the truth coming out, like you said. But then we get the opportunity to make things better, right. and that's that is it. That's the silver lining, and okay. there's always a silver lining, right? And, and we're actually getting the opportunity okay. right now to make things better. Just by finding that silver lining right now, we're putting out positive energy. I mean, that. how could yes. that ever possibly hurt? <laughs> Putting out positive energy is always good. It's always helpful. It's just a good thing, yeah, you know? In fact, I, I, I'm, I'm actually getting to the point where I, I won't go into the details of the people involved, so I'll have to just kind of uh, do it like the like Robert Mueller does, you know, individual one, individual two. But, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, certain of these individuals, I'm actually feeling a little warmer to them now, you know, just because I'm seeing a human side to them that I wasn't seeing before. And, and that alone is a good thing, you know, just just seeing somebody as a human being who you didn't like that. That's a that's a step. That's a step toward that, you know, that more positive place. That's it. There's um, there's a type of meditation that I don't think we've ever done on the podcast, but I know I've talked about it because it's one of my practices. And it's mm -hmm. uh, it's a Buddhist meditation, Brahma Vihara meditation. And in that meditation, one of the ways I do it is I choose four people. The, the number four is myself. But the first three, the first one, someone I love very much. 
And the second one, someone I may not know at all or very well. Maybe mm-hmm. it's just someone I see in passing. But the third one is someone who rubs me the wrong way. Mm. And then the fourth one, like I said, is myself. And in the meditation, I'm sending all four of these people mm. blessings for their health, blessings for good fortune, blessings that they wouldn't feel shame or suffering, right? And You know, when you're sending blessings like that to someone who rubs you the wrong way, (laughs) when you're picturing them healed, happy, fulfilled, free of shame, it 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 has an effect on your heart. You know, it's like Mm -hmm. you have to see them as a human being to be able to do that. Now, I don't recommend doing that with someone who really... Has caused you considerable pain because right. that's hard. Yeah, that's not where you right? start. That, that, that's that's after you've practiced for quite some time on, on lesser <laughs> targets, shall we say? <laughs> but we are all human, and it is good to be able to remind ourselves of that. Right? That all Absolutely. of these people they are human beings, and you know they're not perfect. Yep. Yep. No, it's true. It's very true. And all of us are perfect. I was also noticing too that. As I was watching the hearings, as we were watching them together, I was not in any kind of a space of blaming, of you know, saying, oh, how horrible it is of what they're doing. Uh, th- there was nothing like that going on in my mind. Uh, and interestingly enough, about halfway through this, this morning's hearing, um, the opposition representatives started uttering statements of support for the witness's family. And th- th- this is like not what they really would want to necessarily do. They have this narrative that they're following and anybody who's been following the hearing right. knows, knows what I'm talking about. But they were actually taking the time to express sympathy for the witness's family. I, and I thought that was just a great example of what we're talking about. We put out this energy and the energy got picked up apparently. That, that's pretty cool. Wow. Yeah. Wow. I think I missed that. I only saw maybe the first half. Yeah, so. it didn't happen till like wow. the last uh, 45 minutes or so of the of, of okay. the hearing, that, the first hearing anyway. There's going to be more, I'm sure. But um, yeah, yeah, it was interesting to watch. So again, Good I don't, watch. we're not recommending it. We're not saying go watch this stuff and practice it yourself. Try it on lesser things first. Don't go to this. This is like, a, you know, advanced. <laughs> this is not where Mom you start. Says. Exactly. <laughs> And speaking of advanced, we are talking about Neville Goddard today. His first yes. book, Your Faith is Your Fortune. We're on chapter 10. And, and Neville is very advanced stuff. That's why we have the Neville Decoder ring. And even better, we have the Neville Decoder co-host, life coach, who knows this stuff so well. So, Cindy, I'm going to turn it over to you. Let's let's start looking at some Neville stuff. All right. Well, let's dive in. Well, we have been making our way through uh, Neville Goddard's book, Your Faith is Your Fortune. And we're on chapter 10. And I'm just going to lead right off, as I always do. Um, and forgive me if you're a regular listener and you get really tired of these <laughs> disclaimers about Neville. But for those that may be new listeners or new to Neville, Neville uses a lot of verses from the Christian Bible. And many of those verses are going to be familiar to many people. The caveat is Neville's understanding or explanation of those verses is way out in left field uh, compared to what most of us have learned regarding the, the Christian Bible. And it's really important to recognize that to understand what he's trying to say. Mm-hmm. So whenever Neville talks about God or Christ or Jesus or consciousness, uh, he's usually saying those things mean our consciousness or our imagination. Right. When Neville talks about sin, he's, actually pulling out the correct meaning from the original language, which means to miss the mark. (laughs) Mm. It doesn't have anything to do with something morally wrong or, you know, something evil. It just means it's like you're shooting an arrow at a target and you miss the mark. You miss the bullseye. Maybe you miss the target altogether. And so for Neville, when he talks about forgiveness of sin, he's talking about correcting your aim. Mm -hmm. And so when we think about places in life where we wish we would have gone (laughs) or maybe a goal that we didn't meet. We didn't hit the target of our goal. Uh, Neville's saying, well, forgiveness is the answer. And what that means is just do it again. Just to take better aim, learn from your mistakes, do it over, Mm -hmm. use your imagination. And so we start this chapter 
with a, a verse from the Christian Bible. The chapter title is To Him That Hath. And you, if you're familiar with Christian verses, uh, you may recognize this. Take heed, therefore, how ye hear. For whosoever hath, to him shall be given. And whosoever hath not, from him shall be taken, even that which he seemeth to have. So this is really an interesting verse to me to be explained this way, because we actually talk about this in almost all of the law of attraction teachings. Mm -hmm. And that is, the better it gets, the better it gets. Right. (laughs) (laughs) Right? And we've talked about how uh, somebody asked a question a few weeks ago. They said, how come sometimes we manifest something so easily, but then everything falls apart or we lose it or whatever? Well, that's it has to do with vibration, what Neville's talking about right here. And when we're having a good vibration, we attract more of it. Mm-hmm. When we're feeling good, we attract more things that help us feel good. The better it gets, the better it gets. The same with when we're not. Sometimes we even have things come our way and we can't keep them. We can't hold on to them because they're not aligned with where we are. Yep. So Neville says the Bible, which is the greatest psychological book ever written, that's Neville's uh, proclamation. Yes. Warns man to be aware of what he hears and then follows this warning with the statement, to him that hath it shall be given, and to him that hath not it shall be taken away. Though many look upon this statement as one of the most cruel and unjust of the sayings attributed to Jesus, it still remains a just and merciful law based upon life's changeless principle of expression. Man's ignorance of the working of the law does not excuse him nor save him from the results. And that's true even in our society with laws, right? Oh, sure. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you break a law and then you say, well, I didn't know it was against the law. It doesn't matter. <laughs> you, you still have to pay the consequences. Absolutely. So Neville says law is impersonal and therefore no respecter of persons. He's quoting the Bible again, the Christian Bible. Man is warned to be selective in that which he hears and accepts as true. And something that I think is interesting here is when Neville says back in that second paragraph that many think this is cruel and unjust, Mm -hmm. uh, one of the most cruel and unjust of the sayings attributed to Jesus. This reminds me of something that Abraham said. Mm. Um, Do you know, do you remember what I'm talking about where Abraham says, it seems really unjust that this person that worked so hard would never be able to accrue any kind of wealth. And then this person over here that's barely done a thing suddenly has, you know, all this abundance. And he said, it seems really unjust. But Abraham says, it's actually, there's no law that could be more just because it's always just alignment. Mm hmm. And that's what this reminds me of, what Neville's talking about here. He says that this law is just and merciful. Yeah. Yeah. Abraham often refers to the law of attraction as a fair friend because it always delivers exactly what you put out there. It's always consistent. It's it's as, as consistent as any law that you'll ever find. That's, right. That's it. The consistency. Yeah. And I think that's really, it, it's it's really easy to look at a, at a circumstance and think that it's not fair. Mm. And I know all of us have had a situation in our own life where we think, well, that wasn't fair. Whatever happened to me, right? That wasn't fair. I worked so hard for that promotion and someone else got it. Mm -hmm. Uh, But when you look at it from a vibrational standpoint and just understand that, well, it can't be unfair. Mm -hmm. Yeah. (laughs) It might feel unfair and seem unfair, and the story of it may be really unfair, but vibrationally, it just is what it is. It's just a match or it's not. One of the things that I struggled with early on when I was learning about the law of attraction was this concept of the fairness of it. And the reason I struggled with it was kind of along the lines of what you're talking about, how there are certain people, you know, people like me who would work really, really hard and ended up with nothing. And other people had worked really, really hard and ended up with quite a bit. Uh, and, And that just seemed unfair. But to me, the bigger sense of unfairness was that I didn't know the rule. Nobody had ever explained the rules to me. And I felt I felt cheated because nobody had ever explained the rules. I, it wasn't until I was, let's see, how old was I? I was 51 when I first had the rules explained to me in The Secret. And even then, I only had a cursory examination of them. You know, 
I, nobody ever told yeah. me what the rules were. How? <laughs> it was the first time that somebody ever handed me a handbook to life. <laughs> right. I always think it's funny when I'm coaching. Some, sometimes I have the pleasure and privilege of coaching people who are in their 20s and 30s. And I'll have someone in their 20s say, oh, why didn't I know this when I was younger? Like, I've wasted so much time. And I'm like, oh, wait a minute now. <laughs> These things are relative. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. I mean, so, on the one hand, I get I get really excited when I know that young people are being exposed to this and, and taught how the whole thing works. I love that fact. And at the same moment, there's a piece of me that says, darn, why couldn't I have gotten that? It's the same right. same feeling all wrapped up into one. <laughs> I always just tell myself something that I choose to believe, and that's that every moment is perfect. Yes. And that we learn what we're supposed to learn right on time. And so I just remind myself of that when I start feeling like, boy, I said it the other day to someone, I said, I am such a slow learner yeah. <laughs> and I'm not, but sometimes, sometimes I feel like I want to whack myself on the head. You're just like, something was so obvious and I'm just, oh, why, how did I not see that before? Mm -hmm. I have to remind myself, well, I saw it at the right time. This it's the true. right time to see it. Yeah, that's true. So, Very true. So Neville says, everything that man accepts is true leaves an impression on his consciousness and must in time be defined as proof or disproof. Mm. So this is an interesting thing that goes kind of along with what we were just saying. Notice that it says everything that man accepts as true. Right. <laughs> leaves an impression on his consciousness. You know, so many times we, ex we accept all kinds of things as truth, especially when we're young children and Boy, oh boy, is our consciousness being impressed when we're five, six, seven years old. And yet we just have a, a five-year-old's understanding of that at that time, but it still can leave an impression. And then we come away with these beliefs that we have about love and about money and about life in general. And those impressions on our consciousness, I mean, we know that our consciousness is the thing that's creating. Mm-hmm. So it does us good sometimes to go back and recognize that beliefs that might have served us when we were five or six don't necessarily serve us when we're all grown up. <laughs> That's true. And well, I'm also and my, time, I'm reminded also of we talked about these hearings that were going on while listening to the hearings. My mind and all of our minds who are listening were being impressed with all these messages partisan messages in most cases that were being put onto us by the various speakers who were talking. And the good, the, the good part about the whole thing was I and everybody else was given the opportunity to decide which ones I was going to react to and which ones I was not going to react to. I had control of my reactions. So mm -hmm. even though we have all these forces that are trying to impress this stuff on ourselves, it's up to us what we're going to react to it with. And our reaction is what determines how it's all going to play out for us. So even in those situations where we look back, we say, oh, geez, I had all this stuff that was impressed upon me. Well, yeah, it was. But you still get to decide how you're going to react to it. How are you going to react to it? Even now you get to decide. You don't have to be tied to whatever you decided when you were 12 years old. I find it so interesting to hear you talk about your impressions because I was having the same impressions while I was listening. Really? Like I recognized there were two very distinct sides. Oh, very clear. Two yeah. very clear party lines that were going on. Yep. And normally um, I would definitely choose one over the other. Mm -hmm. But today I felt like I was listening as more of an observer. Yeah. And just thinking, oh, that's interesting. Oh, listen to that. Oh, yeah, okay. Right. <laughs> and totally in control of being able to choose what I wanted to believe, if anything, exactly. I mean, just very, uh, almost a distant kind of listening. And it's really interesting that you're weaving that together into what Neville's saying about this, because I, I see the connection as well. Yeah, there's a tremendous um, power in it. There really is. And it's one that I think we deserve to, uh, to notice in ourselves and to notice when we're when we're applying it the way we want to, and to give ourselves credit for it, because that's how you filter things. That's how you yeah. not let certain things in by just not giving it any power. And, and that plays into what Neville's saying right here. He says, perceptive hearing is the perfect medium through which man registers impressions. Exactly. A man must discipline himself 
to hear only that which he wants to hear, regardless of rumors or the evidence of his senses to the contrary. Right. As he as he conditions his perceptive hearing, he will react only to those impressions which he has decided upon. This law never fails. And I think for both of us, um, the impressions that we decided upon, we weren't going to react really to any of it. <laughs> right? Except perhaps to laugh sometimes. I did laugh a few times. But other than that. I laughed, I laughed a few times as well. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure if that shows, that shows that we have good boundaries or we just have warped senses of humor. I'm not sure which. But well, either way. Probably both. <laughs> yeah, for me, it's probably the warped sense of humor, for sure. <laughs> oh, but, but it's so true. I mean, I'm thinking now as we're talking about this, for the longest time, I thought my job in filtering this stuff out was to keep it from going into my senses. And that's where I think the real important point is here. It's it's not about blocking your senses. It's about no. deciding how you're going to react to what's coming into your senses. It's a big, big right. distinction. Right. And actually, the, the further distinction is deciding that you're going to choose the best response yeah. and not react. Well, that right? too. Yeah, so it's like, exactly. It's not even a reaction. It's a response, which yeah. is something that's thoughtful and chosen and mm -hmm. we're determined about. Yeah. It's deliberate. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's interesting uh, that we are considering ourselves or trying to be, we're in the process of becoming deliberate creators. Yeah. So it's a valuable thing for us to be deliberate in our responses exactly. to things and exactly. not just always reacting. Yeah. If you notice, if you look around and you notice people in your world or in your life or maybe even people through social media there's a lot of, we hear it called a knee-jerk reaction, mm -hmm. right? We hear, we see a lot of reacting going on where people just react. And it's so much more powerful to have a response. Mm -hmm. It's true. It's thoughtful. By the way, Jeffrey gave us a vote of confidence. He says a warped sense of humor is still a sense of humor. So thank you for that, Jeffrey. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> Let's see. Neville says, fully conditioned, man becomes incapable of hearing other than that which contributes to his desire. That one is advanced practice. Mm. <laughs> yeah. God, now remember the disclaimer at the beginning of the show today. God, as you have discovered, is that unconditioned awareness which gives to you all that you are aware of being. This is, one of those aware of, this is one of those sentences where you have to really think through what he's saying because of the multiple we, use of the words are. aware. Right. Because notice that he says, fully conditioned, man becomes incapable of hearing other than that which contributes to his desire. Mm -hmm. So Neville's term, fully conditioned here, if I were fully conditioned... I couldn't even hear people that were telling me evidence that was contrary to whatever was my desire. Right. I would only hear things that were supporting what I wanted to create. Interestingly That's enough, exactly what Congress practice. was doing. <laughs> but then he says, God, and I'm going to change this up a little bit so we're clear. Okay. Because, because Neville says God is our imagination, right? Mm -hmm. So what if he says, so your imagination, as you have discovered, is that unconditioned awareness, which gives to you all that you are aware of being. So I want us just to focus a little bit on the contrast between conditioned, mm -hmm. fully conditioned, and unconditioned. Right. So our imagination, he says, is unconditioned awareness, which gives to us all that we're aware of being. So if my awareness is saying, look at all this evidence of your failure, <laughs> right? If my, if my awareness says that my being is failing at something, mm -hmm. well, then that's what I'm going to start creating evidence of. Right. Yes. Because my imagination is, I wish I could think of a better word than unconditioned and conditioned. But I want to say it's it's like when Neville talks about he uses some of the the Christian verses that say that God or the law is no respecter of persons, mm -hmm. right? 
it's like it rains on the just and the unjust. Mm -hmm. It's one verse that comes to mind. Mm -hmm. So in other words, my imagination, my subconscious, it isn't making a judgment about what's good for me or not. It's just giving me whatever I'm aware of being. So in that sense, it's unconditioned. There's no conditions on it. It just mm -hmm. says, okay. Yep, that's the and way that's it works. What, that's what our subconscious does. Right. It just says, all right, I can do that. If I go around saying all the time, I'm not a very good speaker. I know I'm trying to do this podcast, but, you know, I stutter a lot and I lose my train of thought. <laughs> I'm just not a good speaker. If I just keep saying that, I'll show up one day and I won't be able to speak. Absolutely true. Because my subconscious will say, okay, we can make that happen. There's no conditions. I like the way so they, they express that in The Secret. In the movie The Secret, they invented a genie, and the genie had one thing to say, your wish is my command. That was the unconscious mind. <laughs> they really get us into some trouble. <laughs> they certainly do. <laughs> no careful. kidding. Yeah. Be careful what you wish for thing, right? Right, exactly. Right. Right. So Neville says to be aware of being or having anything is to be or have that which you are aware of being. Upon this changeless principle, all things rest. It's impossible for anything to be other than that which it is aware of being. To him that hath that which he is aware of being, it shall be given. Good, bad, or indifferent, it does not matter. Man receives multiplied a hundredfold that which he is aware of being. In keeping with this changeless law, to him that hath not, it shall be taken from him and added to the one that hath. The rich get richer and the poor get poorer. You can only magnify that which you are conscious of being. We were talking about this in, in a podcast yesterday. It was yesterday afternoon, I believe. Um, the one that I do with uh, Alex King and Bill G, who's now a new co-host. We were we took a, a post on Facebook. And the, the, the general message of the post was, you know, if, if all of the world could be taught uh, how to use the law of attraction so they could become millionaires. Is that possible, first of all? And second of all, wouldn't that just solve the problem of poverty? So we were addressing that, and we were also addressing some of the answers that people had, had posted, because the answers were just as interesting as the questions. The question was in many time, in many cases. Uh, and one of the points that somebody raised was, well, wouldn't it be great if we could just you know, redistribute all the wealth equally to everybody? Then everything would be fine. And I, I was thinking about this right here when the person said that. I said, what would happen is five years later, you'd find the same distribution we got right now. Even if you started from that right. point, it would all just work to that same distribution because of the mindset. The mindset's what's driving right. the whole thing. And here he is saying exactly that. Yeah. I think it reminds me of um, there's a book called The Science of Getting Rich. Yes. By Wallace Waddles. Right. And he talks about all of the reasons that people may have in their minds for being poor or being rich and none of them hold water. Mm. You know, it's not, it's not your education level. He says there are plenty of people with no education who have managed to accrue a lot of wealth. And there are other people that are highly educated that don't have anything. Absolutely. And he goes through every reason like that, your location and your skill and your, you know, just on and on. And it reminds me of that. It, it really makes the point that, we're talking about something more than just being born into wealth or being highly skilled or highly educated or or none of those things or being born on the wrong side of town or whatever it is. It's like there has to be something else to it. Mm -hmm. And, of course, we know there is. It's That's vibration right. and it's alignment. It's consciousness and it's awareness of being. And I, I agree with you 100% that if we just redistributed everything, it would go back to it would go back into the, the balance or unbalance that we have now because it's all related to consciousness. Yeah. That's really interesting. It is. So was there ever consensus among your dis, uh, discussion in the, in the chat on yesterday? On that point, we all agreed, <laughs> I think. We, we all definitely yeah. agreed on that. Especially, well, ironically, Bill G., I used to do a show before LOA Today with him on PRN, where, of course, we are these shows as well called the Freedom News Hour, in which we discuss things such as monetary policy. And, you know, one of the things of monetary policy is wealth distribution and so forth. So we'd previously right. talked about this, but not in a law of attraction perspective before I even knew what law of attraction was. I don't think he knew what it was at that point either. And now here we are talking about it again. So the irony was not lost on us at all. <laughs> That's great. That's really great. Yeah. That, 
talk about getting to come full circle and revisit, no kidding. you know, no kidding. things with a different kind of perspective. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So let's see. So, so Neville says, and this is exactly what you just said. Neville says, all things gravitate to that consciousness with which they are in tune. Yes. <laughs> Likewise, all things disentangle themselves from that consciousness with which they are out of tune. Now, this is a really great thing to recognize because so often we have things going on in our life that we wish weren't going on. In mm -hmm. our life, right? Absolutely. And, so the understanding is that as soon as we're not aligned with those things, those things will disentangle themselves from us. Yep. We don't have to do anything no. often <laughs> to, to be free of them once once our consciousness isn't lined up with it anymore. Mm -hmm. Or he says once we're out of tune with it, right? Right. Exactly. I, I'm oh, also I'm also reminded this. of something. Look at this. What? You're gonna love it, right? Divide the wealth of the world equally. Oh, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> and in a short time, this equal division will be as originally disproportioned. <laughs> wealth will find its way back into the pockets of those from whom it was taken. Fabulous. Instead of joining the chorus of the have-nots who insist on destroying those who have. Recognize this changeless law of expression. Consciously define yourself as that which you desire. That's exactly what we were just saying. Hey, precisely. Wow. That's really cool how exact it is. It's the same <laughs> example and everything. I love it. The this thing happens that... to us pretty often. Tell me about it. <laughs> no kidding. It makes, me, it makes me think, hey, see, we're aligned with Neville. <laughs> That's got to be a good thing. <laughs> it is. And yet I'm also reminded here, I mean... Those of us who are practicing this stuff, and this includes me for sure. For me, this is, wealth is the hardest issue one for me. I, I can handle the relationship stuff pretty good. Health stuff I'm getting pretty good at. Um, career stuff, uh, okay, not wonderful, not bad. But the wealth stuff, that's the one I'm still learning. I'm still trying to, to get myself to learn what it feels like to be in that vibrational state and stay there. I can get there for periods of time, but I have a hard time staying there sometimes. And that, so that, this is the thing that I'm learning right now. And so even though we have this knowledge, this great information, and Neville has effectively given me what I wanted all those years. I wanted the rule book. He's handed me the rule book. Now I got the rule book. Now I understand. I still have right. to apply it. I still have to learn to do it. Right. Just like we say all the time is that this stuff doesn't work in theory. Right. Right. And, and you know, as a musician, which I know you are, as a, a dancer, as an athlete, mm -hmm. like we all know, we can read about that stuff all day long. Absolutely. We can we can open a book and see the dance steps, go through them in our mind and know what they are. But if we never get out on the dance floor and be willing to make a misstep, step on our partner's feet, trip ourselves up, look like a fool, um, <laughs> then we're probably never going to be really good at it. That's right. There was a special. So, there was a special on TV uh, about David McCullough, who is an American biographer and uh, uh, nonfiction writer. He's written some really interesting stuff. Some of his stuff's been made into films. Um, for instance, he wrote the stuff that led to the John Adams series that appeared on cable TV a few years back. And he he made a really interesting comment about his pursuit of being an artist as a hobby. And his comment was, you can't learn to be an artist through books. The only way to learn to be an artist is to paint. You, can, you have to paint. If you don't paint, you can never, ever learn it. And it, I thought that was just perfect. It was just right in line with what we're talking about here. And it's true. Exactly right. Yeah, you have to paint if you want to be an artist. You just have to. Right. And, you know, if you're painting, you're going to make some really bad paintings before right. you make some really great paintings. And yeah. if you'll notice, the people that have... You know, one of my friends who is an artist, uh, and, and I am an artist, but early on in my making art, she said something to me. She said, we were, we were at a gallery looking at, you know, a show of full of amazing paintings. And she said, but you know, for every one painting that you see from this artist that's fantastic, there's probably 10 or 20 or 30 or a hundred that are that they'll never show right and we went to see uh we went on a artist studio tour where there were like 10 artists in the city that opened their studios so we could go in and see 
And there was a one particular artist that was a painter. And sometimes artists will paint on paper mm -hmm. instead of on canvas because canvas is so much more expensive. Sure. And this this person had, oh, there were those big sliding do drawers that come out that hold paper. There were probably 400 paintings on paper Ooh. that were just all stacked together that were never going to be shown, right? Wow. Um, but but their body of work was huge. Yeah. And so I when I relate that to us as conscious creators, you know, making a painting is a creation, right? Absolutely. And we're trying to deliberately create whatever it is in our life. And there's an idea that in order to be really good at something, we have to be willing to be bad at it. Mm -hmm. first we have to be willing to go try it to make some mistakes to keep going and keep going and i think that that is the issue that we run up against sometimes with knowing with having this handbook and knowing the theory is number one we either just keep learning theory and we never put it into practice or when we do put it into practice and it feels like a failure we quit right right exactly. and i mean when you were talking about dealing with wealth, I, I was reminded of this one particular time. Every once in a while, I just decide I want to up level my level of money, my income, and, and I'll do some particular workings to make that happen. And one of the things that I did a couple of years ago was um, I decided, well, we need to just go out this weekend and just really – walk in those shoes a little bit mm. and we were downtown and I kept seeing this five-star hotel I said we should go stay there and just really live it up you know just step into that position well I kept saying that over a period of a couple of months and lo and behold something that seemed very bad happened in our home that we had to have the insurance come look at and we had to have it redone and we ended up having to stay at a hotel and the insurance actually said, well, did you choose a hotel? And I said, well, actually I do, but I really thought they were going to say, Oh no, that one's not a bit. And they said, okay. <laughs> so we ended up staying in this five star hotel. And when we got there to check in, it was so funny. The room, the doors of the rooms looked like bank vaults. Really? I mean, they look that they're made to, it's in an old bank building. So oh, they no made kidding. the doors look like bank vaults. <laughs> so we were just cracking up laughing as we walked in. And when we go inside, there's a mirror, a big mirror, and it's etched. And it says, uh, when you when you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. No kidding. Mm -hmm. I wow. have pictures. I have pictures. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> but here's the thing that happened. We went to dinner that night, and the manager of the restaurant knew me from a previous uh, sales job I had when I had worked with him when he was in another restaurant oh, okay. and I was, I was selling ads. Right. And so I knew him from that. He came over and said hello to us. And then we went down for dinner the next night and he sent like a $200 bottle of wine to our table. Ooh, nice. Right. And so we were really like digging this stuff. Yeah. It was like, Hey, it's working. It's working. But then we went out with some friends and I ordered a glass of wine that was really expensive. And when the waiter came around and asked if we would want a second one, I realized in myself, it's like, I really, and my husband, who was then my fiance said, have another one, go ahead. And I was like, <laughs> see, I realized how out of vibration I was with spending that much money for it. I was kind of going all right with the first one, but when it came to a second one, it was expensive. And I was like, oh, see, just, just couldn't handle it. <laughs> it, 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 it underlines your point beautifully that we have to practice. <laughs> Yeah, we, we we will make yeah. mistakes. I mean, you 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 did a beautiful job with the first part. You were getting it. You were in the groove, and then you fell <laughs> off the track entirely. And that's what happens. We do that. We do, and it's okay. Right. It's perfectly right. okay. We just so have to give like ourselves saying, credit you know, for it. We had practice and practice. We went out on the dance floor. We were ready to be on Dancing with the Stars. We did a fabulous job, but then they called us back for the second round and my feet just couldn't find the ground and I tripped all over the place. Exactly. That's what it was like. Yeah. And that was what it was like. And so 
it's like, okay, that second song, the tempo is a little too fast. <laughs> <laughs> Jeffrey's saying, tell me a little bit more about the wine. I think he wants some of the wine. <laughs> He says, drink it up. I can't remember. I can't remember. (laughs) That's funny that I can't remember what it was. But uh, I don't know. I will tell you a funny funny story with my warped sense of humor uh, about (laughs) wine. It's totally off topic of this book. But we were at a wine tasting, and the waiter came over and showed us the bottle of wine. And the name of the wine was, or the winery, one of the other was Pessimist. Oh, I remember that. And my yes. husband said, in a very whiny voice, I bet we're not going to like it. <laughs> <laughs> Which I still, to this day, think is hysterical. It All is. Right, it's so great. let's not get too far off track. So Neville is right in line with us, though. Because Absolutely. he says, instead of joining the chorus of the have-nots who insist on destroying those who have, recognize this changeless law of expression Consciously define yourself as that which you desire. Once defined, your conscious claim established, continue in this confidence until the reward is received. That's the part that we're practicing. We're wanting to continue in the confidence (laughs) and not make a misstep and trip up and step on our partner's feet on the dance floor. And I love our message. Our message is if you do trip up, don't worry about it. I mean, your goal, sure, the goal is to keep doing it continuously, but if you screw up, eh, it's all right. Just get back on your feet and keep going. You know, when, when I was in sales and I was a sales manager, one of the things that we used to tell the sales team was the first one to a hundred no's wins. Oh yeah. yeah. Get out there and let people tell you, no, they're not buying what you're selling. No, Mm -hmm. they don't want it. No. Why? Because the more you get out there, the more practice you have and the more no's you hear, guess what else? You hear more yeses yeses. and you make more sales. It's just, and that's what this is all about. It's continuing in the confidence. Get up and do it again. Keep going. Keep going. You're getting practice and you're getting better at it, whether you recognize it or not. So Neville says, as surely as the day follows the night, any attribute consciously claimed will manifest itself. Thus, that which to the sleeping orthodox world is a cruel and unjust law becomes to the enlightened one of the most merciful and just statements of truth. And I think Neville was channeling Abraham on that one. <laughs> kind of, yeah. I am come not to destroy, but to fulfill. Nothing is actually destroyed. Any seeming destruction is a result of a change in consciousness. What do you think of when you hear that? Well, nothing's actually destroyed. Any seeming destruction is a result of a change in consciousness. What is he talking about when he says destruction? Yeah, it's an interesting uh, phrasing there. I kind of take it on the thought level rather than on the physical level. Because on the Me thought too. on the thought level, what we're talking about is changing thoughts. Changing your mind, right. you know, refocusing on something else. And if we understand it, what he's saying in, in that realm, then what we're really saying is, okay, yeah, I'm on, the, I'm, I'm on thought A right now, but I'm going to change tracks to thought B, and I'm going to focus on that for a while. But thought A never got lost. It never got destroyed. It just, I, I, I just kind of left it behind, and it's no longer part of my personal experience. But, but it still exists. It's still there. Um, so th- just the moment of changing my consciousness, it may seem like I destroyed that idea, but actually all I did was just leave it behind. I kind of think of, you know, the example that I was giving about, um, stepping into a higher level of wealth consciousness. Mm-hmm. Like I felt like I could have felt like I destroyed the whole thing. It was going along so beautifully. Boy, I mean, we were just getting gifts and Things were, you know, coming our way left and right. And then, but it wasn't destruction. It was a change in consciousness. Yeah. I I actually left that level of consciousness and went back to my old way of thinking where I was like, oh, this is not real comfortable for me. Mm-hmm. Um, but in the process, I also had that awareness, which is part of the learning curve. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that awareness is key because that awareness is how we uh, make a mistake, get back on the wagon and try again. So here's what Neville ends this chapter with saying. He says, consciousness ever fills full 
the state in which it dwells. The state from which consciousness is detached seems to those not familiar with this law to be destructive. However, this is only preparatory to a new state of consciousness. That's claim yourself word. to be that which. Go ahead. Claim yourself to be that which you want filled full. Nothing is destroyed. All is fulfilled. To him that hath, it shall be given. <laughs> and there's a preparatory to a new state of consciousness. That's what I was kind of sensing. There's also a typo. It was just part of the learning here. process. <laughs> there's a typo in the last sentence on the book. It says, "To him that bath, it shall be given." B instead of H. <laughs> that was kind of funny. <laughs> But uh, I, I'm struck by the word detached. The state from which consciousness is detached seems to those not familiar with this law of destruction of with this law to be destructive. What do you think he means by detached? I'm not quite following what detached is. Well, What's I think it's the state from which consciousness is detached. In other words, when my consciousness became unattached to the same vibration of the wealth consciousness that I was trying to stay in vibration with, it felt like it was destructive. Oh, okay. oh no, there everything went. <laughs> and yet it wasn't. It was just preparing me for a new state of consciousness. It was bringing to my awareness the lack of alignment so that I could come back into alignment. Okay. That's how I read that. Okay, because when, when I saw the phrase, the state from which consciousness is detached, I asked myself, how can you detach your consciousness? I don't see any way to do it. But now I understand what you're talking about. You're talking about being consciously attached to X, whatever X is. X is some thought or some thing you're trying to manifest or whatever. It's, it's, it's right. the thought process that, that you're, a particular thought process that you're detaching from so you can attach to some new one. Now I understand. Okay. I think it's the same as when he says in tune with an out of tune, okay. uh, aligned, unaligned or misaligned. Um, it's it's just out of vibration, I mm -hmm. think. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's yeah. how I understand it. No, now, well, that makes sense. That makes sense. Further than, yeah. I, I think you've got it. I think that does it right there. Um, the the whole section here, this last uh, half, one third of the chapter, whatever it is, that that this last section is fascinating, partly because it had the example that lined up perfectly with what we were talking about, and I just love that. But also <laughs> because he finds a way here to talk about being kind to yourself about making mistakes without actually saying anything about making a mistake. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? Because that's really what yeah, he's talking talk about, about here. Yeah, talk about that a little bit. Well, just that uh, it's, it's like you were talking about before when you, when you define his use of the word sin, that a sin is just simply missing the mark. It's a mistake, a mistake. I just missed, that's yes. all. I got to change my, my aim. Right. Well, one of the things that we tend to do as human beings is, as we're learning this stuff, we keep trying to refine the way we express things. And oh, you know, there's like the PC side of it. Oh, I don't really want to say it that way. That's the wrong way to say it, and all that kind of thing. Uh, and, and so we, we kind of get ourselves into these little little word games, these little traps, and we, we ask ourselves, well, okay, so I, how do I avoid saying that I made a mistake? Oh God, I got to find some way out of it. Well, he doesn't even talk about mistakes. It just doesn't even enter the right. conversation. Right. He's actually talking about it, but he talks about it without actually saying anything about it, which is kind of interesting. <laughs> well, I like the idea that, you know, it it's so much kinder to ourselves and gentler to ourselves and others too to recognize that it's it's just being out of alignment. Mhm. Mm yeah. You know, especially with the way we were talking about wealth distribution and you know, there's a real imbalance Mm. now of that right and part of the problem that i see and the problem is huge and there's probably a lot of elements to it but part of it that i see is that wealth gets equated with merit yes and when wealth gets equated with merit then poverty becomes a crime right or a defect yes right a and, flaw, a failure. and that's not it's not a crime mm -hmm. to be impoverished. It's right. just a lack of alignment. Mm -hmm. And so it's a lot, it's a lot kinder mm -hmm. to look at it that way. And so, you know, Neville's talking about in this chapter, how so many people may view this law as being unjust. And yet he says, it's not, it's completely just. And, 
that's a real key thing to get is that when we talk about vibration and alignment, uh, it's a lot more kind than it is if we think that because someone has a bad relationship or because they're impoverished, that there's something defective with the person. Jeffrey's, it's not. It's just a vibrational thing. Jeffrey's leading the way with comments. He seems to be the one who's giving the most comments for us to use. He says, can we actually make a mistake? And it's a good point. Can we? Is it really possible I, to make a mistake? I choose to have a belief that says there are no mistakes. Mm. There's just human experience. Yeah. Now, if you work a math problem, you can have a mistake. But that's just, you know, an error. <laughs> but even then, the, the, the word mistake, I just didn't take it right. You know, I, I reached over for the thing and I thought I was picking it, but oh, I didn't. I actually dropped it. That was just a mistake. I actually really like that. Yeah. A mistake. That's all it is. I just, I'm going to do a take two. Yep. Take two. <laughs> Well, which take I'm, partic two. I'm particularly oh. sensitive to because I don't have vision in one eye, so I don't have depth perception. So it's easy for me to reach for something and miss it. You know, I I actually have to reach for it, touch it, get a feel for where it is, and then grab it. Otherwise, I'm just as likely to drop it because I I miss. You know, <laughs> it's a mistake. Yeah, that's that's my take on mistakes. I don't believe there are mistakes; just yeah. human experience. I agree. I agree. It, it also reminds me of of the story you like to tell about the. I think he's a Chinese farmer. Um, good luck, bad luck. It's kind of the same philosophy going on there. Just, you know, you're not going to look at it one way or another as being good or bad. I'm just going to go with the flow and just, it is what it is. And do you know that, uh, last night we watched this documentary sort of movie about the stories of Bill Murray. Oh, no kidding. Which I don't know if you're a Bill Murray fan or if you know, you know, about this, but apparently Bill Murray has a reputation for, just like showing up uninvited at some party in some city, you know, and, and, and doing the dishes in the kitchen and just, you know, just really funny. And all of these stories got to be kind of legendary. And so this guy did a documentary about it in the documentary. There are a lot, there's a lot of conversation about Bill Murray and about his take on life and how he lives life and different things. Someone told that story. Someone told my story. <laughs> no kidding. Oh, wow. That's fabulous. <laughs> my husband and I kept looking at each other. Oh, my gosh. Okay, <laughs> this I mean, certainly I didn't invent the story. It's an old proverb. But sure. uh, I certainly have told it quite a few times. It was really funny to hear someone telling it on, you know, a, a film on TV. But anyway. <laughs> oh, that's cool. That's really cool. Maybe, maybe we should tell the story. So people that sure, have yeah, heard Go ahead. It tell it. I, I love the story. So tell it. It's great. So there's a, a story about a Chinese farmer. It's an old proverb that says this, this farmer had one horse. He was very poor. He had one horse to help him do his work. And that was pretty much the only thing of value that he owned was this one horse. And one day the horse runs away. Mm. And the farmer's neighbor comes over and says, wow, what, what terrible luck. You know, uh, I'm so sorry. And the farmer says, Good luck, bad luck. Who knows? And a week later, his horse comes home bringing a dozen feral horses with him. Big, strong, powerful horses. And, of course, the neighbors come over and say, wow, what good luck. Look at these beautiful horses. What good luck. And the farmer says, good luck, bad luck. You know, who knows? So a short time after that, the farmer's son is out. He's trying to train one of the horses, trying to break this wild horse. And the horse throws him. He breaks his leg. Of course, all of the neighbors now are like, oh, this farmer has the worst luck. And the farmer says, good luck, bad luck. Who knows? Short time after that, they decide that they're going off to war, this province, and they come through conscripting all of the young, able-bodied men, but his son has a broken leg, so he doesn't have to go. And, of course, the neighbors see this as great good, good luck. luck again. To yep. which, of course, he <laughs> says, good luck, bad luck. Who knows? And you could go on and on with this story. Right. The, the, the story is that many times things that we think are really good end up producing some experience that's not so good. And sometimes things that we think are really bad uh, lead us somewhere where something wonderful happens. And that story has like helped me through a lot of things, mm. right? <laughs> a lot of things. And so I, I'm always forever telling that story to clients and <laughs> teaching that idea to people. It's great to see it in a movie. <laughs> yeah, cool. That you see, saw it in a movie. That's very cool. Especially one about Bill Murray, because Bill is like the consummate straight man. 
I mean, he's not really a comedian per se. He's more of the straight man type. But he's one of the funniest straight men you'll ever see. <laughs> he gets, uh, he well, comes up with this I, stuff. Oh. <laughs> I believe it's called The Stories of Bill Murray. It's on Netflix, so mm -hmm. you may want to watch it. It was it was a, a feel good kind of thing. It was, mm -hmm. it was worth watching. Yeah. <laughs> good vibes. He, he he's done a lot of movies. Uh, one movie that comes to mind is a movie that came out a few years ago that uh, George Clooney did called Monuments Men, and Bill Murray was in that one. He he played uh, okay. one of the uh, the story of. Um, uh, a small group of artistic types who joined the army during World War II in order to save the works of art that that the Nazis were threatening to destroy or to steal wow. or whatever. Um, fascinating uh, film and pretty good, pretty good uh, uh, rendering of, of what happened. But uh, this this uh, special division of, of the military ended up saving tens of thousands of works of art as a result. And oh, wow. they recovered uh, uh, so, like huge amounts of information and, and huge, huge amounts of pieces. They they saved some famous works, Michelangelo's and so forth. They they saved a lot of really important stuff. Um, and th this movie just tries to tell the story of it. Well, Bill Murray is one of the characters in the movie. He's an architect, and he gets drafted in a sense, invited by his friend, played by George Clooney, to come join this outfit to go save the works of art. And he he plays a very um, kind of a disconnected kind of a character who's always kind of snide about this one associate of his who's who's a choreographer who becomes his inferior. That this guy's a private and and uh, Bill Murray is a sergeant or something like that. I forget exactly what the ranks were, but they have the, this love hate relationship going on that they play throughout. He does a brilliant job. All the actors are very good, really really good in that movie. So I recommend. Well, thank it. you. I just wrote down the name of it. Yeah, I'll have to check go. it out. <laughs> well, you, you like the last one that I recommended. I know. Cause I, I, I sent you to, uh, what was it? The hundred, hundred foot journey. Is that the one I sent you to? Yes. Yeah. Another excellent film. Another one. So anyway, well, this has been good talk about, uh, Neville. I can't wait to get on to chapter 11. The only sad part is that we're done for the week, but we're nevertheless, it's week. been good. Um, yes. be before we, uh, move on, I want to also give you a chance to do your little PR work. Tell people how they can reach out to you as a coach. Yeah, they can reach out to me online at cindychavez.com. It's C-I-N-D-I-E-C-H-A-V-E-Z.com. That's my website, and there's a contact form there and all kind of goodies. And I would love to hear from you. Give me a shout-out. Say hello. <laughs> We've got about a minute left, and we don't really have time to do this, but I'm going to bring it up anyway because Jeffrey posed a question, and we really hadn't had any audience questions, so I figured we'll at least pose it. He says, Funny question. Can we change our physical bodies based solely on practicing a belief? For example, can we make ourselves believe that we have 20-20 vision out of both eyes? Think we can do that I in a minute? I would say yes. <laughs> I, think I so would too. say yes, and I would say easier said than done. Yes. But I think, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that you, you said it earlier. It's about the vibration. And the trick there is, and I, it's one I'm still trying to master because I want to get my eyesight back in my second eye. Um, it's about always being in the vibration of, yes, I have great eyesight in both eyes in the face of the fact that I'm constantly experiencing eyesight in one eye. That's, that's right. a big challenge. Yeah. That's a huge that's challenge. The challenge. Yeah. Yeah. Can I do but that? If you can do Possible. It. Sure. I say yes. <laughs> I think so. I think so. It's one of my goals. I mean, literally Cindy, it's one of my goals. <laughs> I have, I yeah. have a number of them. Another one of my goal, believe it or not, is to change my hair color without using any any dyes or, or you know over the counter products, just by making myself younger. Okay. <laughs> my, my wife thinks I'm crazy. She likes my white hair the way it is, but uh, I, I want to be able to do that just to see if I can do it. So see, she's <laughs> over there doing her own law of attraction. That's stuff right. Your... <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Fortunately, I do know that where my stuff is concerned, mine wins if I stick to it. So I don't have to be influenced by that if I don't want to be. <laughs> if you stick to it. If you stick to if it. If I stick to it. That's <laughs> it. That's it. And it's a big caveat. It's huge. It's huge because right. it's easy to be influenced by somebody else. But hey, right. that's that's what we're doing. We're practicing. We're all practicing. practicing. That's one of the reasons I love doing the show. I love doing it with you too, specifically. And uh, so thank you for being our, our Neville expert. I really appreciate that. <laughs> You're welcome. I love being here. And I uh, look forward to doing it again next week. We hope that all of our listeners will join us as well next time here on LOA Today. Goodbye, everybody. Bye, everyone.